I woke up one morning with a pounding headache when I was seven and a half months pregnant. I had an early morning doctor's appointment. My husband said that he would take me, and I told him no. I have a meeting right after, and I want you to just follow me, and I don't want to be late for my meeting. Up until that point, everything in my life had been go, go, go. But I was, as I was walking out the door, I realized I couldn't see properly. The walls around me had disappeared. The tiles beneath my feet were a blur. I had lost my vision. I suffered from a medical condition called severe preeclampsia, which occurs suddenly and without any warning. My internal medicine doctor told me that 90% of the women with the severity of my condition die. Following my operation, my vision was restored. In the next five weeks that my son would spend in the neonatal intensive care unit at the University of Florida Shands Hospital, I realized the importance of electricity. It was the lifeblood of our survival and healing. The electricity that was supplied to the incubators and heart monitors was life-saving. Without the warmth that was generated through electricity, my son wouldn't have survived. Having also undergone a temporary loss of vision, I was more empathetic to those who suffered blackouts on a daily basis. And this brings me to my first point, as to why we need electricity. The ability to survive and thrive as a civilization depends upon electricity. I see a world in 15 years very different than today. The future I see relies on a mix of clean energy sources. The future I see is going to move away from fossil fuels. I want you to come with me on a journey to see how we will move away from fossil fuels to solar, wind, and hydropower with the help of biofuels. First, I'm going to describe to you the need for electricity and why fossil fuels are no longer sustainable. Then I'll talk about the problems with conventional biofuels from sugar, corn, soy, palm oil. And then I'll talk about why we need what are called advanced biofuels. So getting back to my first point, the International Energy Agency reports that 1.2 billion people of the world do not have access to electricity, and 2.7 billion people do not have clean cooking facilities. Now imagine how much different the world would be if everybody had access to clean and reliable electricity. That is the goal behind the United Nations Sustainable Energy for All initiative, which seeks to ensure universal energy access to double the rate of renewable energy in the global energy mix and to double the rate of energy efficiency, all by the year 2030. At the same time, that surge in electricity and fuel use would place unprecedented demands on our ecosystem. The pro this brings me to my second point as to why fossil fuels are such a train wreck. The increased reliance on fossil fuels has led to climate change, oil spills, acid rain, and natural resource conflict. This map shows changes to my home state of Florida with 20 feet of sea level rise. If the oceans rose just five feet, one million homes around the coast would be underwater during high tide. I was making fun of my cousin in Miami that when climate change happens, she would be underwater. 
One week later, the Rocky Mountain region outside of Denver, where I was living at the time, experienced severe flooding of biblical proportions. I was trapped in my home for two days. Climate change wasn't a joke then. This map shows how fossil fuels still provide most of the electricity that we used. Renewables are only a very small sliver of that energy pie. We want to move away from fossil fuel use. While wind and solar are the future of renewables, they need another energy source to diversify the energy portfolio. Because solar and wind require brand new energy infrastructure for, for because of their transmission and storage problems. And that's where biofuels enter the mix. Because biofuels can use existing pipelines and pumps and refineries with only slight modification. And this brings me to my third point as to why biofuels are vital for their transition to renewable energy. Biofuels are derived directly or indirectly from organic materials, which include plant materials and animal waste. Biofuels are not intermittent, like power from the sun or wind. The problem with biofuels is not all biofuels are the same. Kenyan environmental activist and Nobel laureate Wangari Mathai says, we not only have to work to protect the environment, we also have to improve governance. Do you know how I first found out about biofuels? Was through marijuana. Yes, marijuana. I was visiting Pakistan as a kid, and I saw marijuana growing wild in the fields, on the sides of the roads, everywhere. I asked, why is there marijuana everywhere? I was told that the villagers burned it and used it as fuel. I kept quiet about what we used marijuana for over here. <laughs> I was also told that I could not bring any marijuana back home with me on the plane as a souvenir. <laughs> and that is special thanks to my father who is here in the audience. But getting back to my talk, we all know about the concerns for public health and the environment with oil and gas drilling. But biofuels from sugar, corn, soy, and palm oil have been given a free pass. Policy expert Ariel Brunner says the current biomass gold rush is damaging to both biodiversity and the climate. We urgently need a sustainability framework that also protects our forests. We have to factor all the social costs of unearthing biofuels as a clean energy source. And when we do that, we see that there's more than meets the eye. Carbon emissions from conventional biofuels are the same as fossil fuels when accounting for the full life cycle analysis from the planting of the seeds to the harvesting of the crops to the bringing the ethanol to market. When we factor in death squads in Honduras, slash and burn techniques in Indonesian forests, land grabbing in Guatemala, and the harvesting of ecologically sensitive hardwood forest all across the United States, even here in our own backyard, we see that biofuels are hardly the vision of a pristine, clean energy future. We call these agriculture and forest biofuels problematic. I call them blood biofuels because of their adverse impacts on the lives and livelihoods of those in the global south and the poor and marginalized within our own communities here in the US. Blood biofuels are only slightly less environmentally and socially devastating than the finite fossil fuels they seek to replace. I'll give you an example of blood biofuels. There was a group of small farmers in a remote region of Honduras who had tracts of land that were valuable to a large biofuel company. What the biofuel company did is that it wanted that land. And so the farmers banded together and formed groups to negotiate their land rights. Following intense negotiations, the farmers were awarded provisional land title. 
when the farmers resumed their activities and went back to the land, they were greeted by armed security forces from the biofuel company. They were told to leave the land. And on one of these encounters, these armed forces from the biofuel company opened fire, killing six farmers and critically injuring two others. They were killed for biofuels, blood biofuels. These are the types of conflicts that are fueling our desire for clean energy. Berta Caceres said, Mother Earth militarized, fenced in, poisoned. A place where basic rights are systematically violated demands that we take action. I want you to look at her. Look at her carefully. She was assassinated earlier this year in Honduras for her environmental activism in protecting native lands from energy projects. She gave her life for this struggle. Honduras has become the most violent country in the world outside of an active conflict zone because of these energy and resource problems. In poor countries with large indigent populations, the risk of falling into the poverty trap is dangerously high. Food cultivation is a determining factor of poverty. Where the poverty trap looms large is where greater attention has to be given to manage scarce and limited natural resources of land, fresh water, and agricultural crops. An ancillary issue to food shortages is agricultural subsidies. The average European cow gets a subsidy of $2 a day. The World Bank measure of poverty is $2 a day. Half the people in the developing world live on less than that. Sadly, it appears it is better to be a cow in Europe than a poor person in a developing country. These income and resource inequalities highlight how the third world is providing for our living standards through its lands, livelihoods, and lives. The same way bombs have followed oil, drones have followed drought. The use of land for the development of biofuels clashes with the need of land for food production. Increases in energy prices have caused farmers to shift production from food crops to fuel crops, creating a ripple effect because the food still has to be produced someplace. And this brings me to my next point. We need advanced biofuels. Advanced biofuels can use existing energy systems. It is better to make ethanol from the inedible parts of the corn than the edible parts of the corn that can be used as food and animal, and animal feed. <coughs> advanced biofuels are the new kids on the block. They can use existing energy systems and infrastructure such as pipelines, pumps, and refineries. Advanced biofuels are amazing. We are going to be able to not have to compete with food crops. The problem is for advanced biofuels that there is not the law and policy. Advanced biofuels are the new kids on the block. They can work to replace the entire gasoline market. Algae replicates fast and is less land intensive, and it can be grown out in the open ocean or in ponds, similar to the way as farm-raised fish is grown. But we need new laws in clean energy. And that brings me to my last point as to why advanced biofuels are crucial in the transition to clean energy. We need international cooperation and new laws for innovation and investment to improve our future. We not only have to be concerned about providing for our needs, but of our children and beyond. 
The U.S. Department of Energy wants to triple the size of today's bioeconomy by the year 2030 to more than a billion tons of biomass. Imagine that. Because of soaring energy demands, there is a single minded determination to achieve this goal. What is worrisome with this goal is the amount of environmental and social degradation that will occur. More attention has to be given to these factors. The driver for a billion ton bioeconomy is economics. Follow the money trail. Not all biofuels are the same. Earlier this year, I traveled to the headquarters of the International Renewable Energy Agency, known as IRENA, for its annual meeting in Abu Dhabi in the United Arab Emirates. IRENA is a United Nations affiliated organization which seeks to aid countries in their transition to renewables. IRENA serves as a repository of scientific, policy, technological, resource, and financial knowledge. The same part of the world that is providing us petroleum is also leading in renewable energy development. IRENA's vision is astonishing. It wants to double the rate of renewable energy, but it has created a global roadmap to doing that. Why are we falling behind other parts of the world when it comes to renewable energy development? If we value our freedom, if we value human rights, we must seek out clean energy. Without electricity, there is no development. And without development, there is no democracy. One of the innovations from IRENA is the Global Atlas app. You can download it right now on your mobile devices. This tool is the only one of its kind. It provides you information about renewable energy resources anywhere in the world. It takes data from 1,000 maps from 67 governments and 50 data centers and puts this information right at your fingertips. For a geography geek like me, this app was the most exciting thing since Google Earth. I was in New York City in 2014 for the People's Climate March. I joined 400,000 strong to stand in solidarity for climate action. We need climate change adaptation measures. We need clean energy protection. My son and I were able to survive because electricity was there when we needed it. Electricity should not be a luxury for the select few. I used to have this quote on my door as a kid by Mark Twain. He said, always do right. This will gratify some people and astonish the rest. And that's what we have to do for clean energy. We have to make the hard choices. We have to tell our elected leaders that we support clean energy and climate change adaptation. We all need to be a part of this movement. Every movement needs a critical mass. The people in this room, the people who are listening, can be a part of this movement. We need lawyers, doctors, engineers, plumbers, truck drivers, sanitation workers, students, teachers, everyone. You six over here, I want you to be a part of that movement. We all have to work for having clean energy. If my parents' generation raced to the moon, my generation must race to find the clean energy solutions. Our survival as a planet and population depends upon it. Thank you.